this is the outline of my talk today. Uh, so let me start with the first part, gauge linear sigma model. The input data of a gauge linear sigma model is a five tuple, V, G, C star, R, W, and omega, where uh, V is just a complex linear space of certain dimension M, just the word linear. And G uh, gauge group is just a linear reductive subgroup on GLV acting linearly on this vector space. And there's another C star R. So we also assume it's a subgroup of the general linear group, and isomorphic to C star, and is known as uh, the group of R symmetries. The condition of this uh, two subgroup is their action commute, and their intersection is finite. And this C star C star R is uh, just isomorphic to C star. It's generated by some uh, element of finite order called R. Um, so just some notation, the C star R acts on V by some weights and the R charges in the physical literature, uh, the QJ is equal to two CJ over R. So it can be rational. Um, so then the so-called superpotential is just a polynomial in uh, the coordinates X1 to XM and it's assumed to be G invariant, invariant under the action of the gauge group. And with respect to the action of R symmetries, it's quite homogeneous. Yeah, so we V, G, C star, W, and the last condition is a stability condition. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a character of G. And it's because V is just a fine space. So a, a G linearization, any line bundle on V is trivial. So a uh, G linearization is just a character of G. And we make the assumption that this uh, character is chosen such that uh, the semi-stable locus is equal to the stable locus. Um, so under this assumption, the, if we form the quotient stack is a smooth domain Manfred stack, actually just a smooth orbifold. And if we look at, and then it has a coarse moduli space is a GIT quotient uh, defined by this group action G and the stability condition omega. Um, yeah, it has at most quotient singularities. And now uh, this C, so C star, so C, C star W, oh, let's see. Yeah, C star W is the uh, C star quotient by the intersection with the gauge group. So C star W doesn't, doesn't act on V, but it acts on this quotient. And X omega uh, is projective over this affine space. So we usually assume this X zero is non-compact. Otherwise there's all the super potential will be constant. And then with respect to this C star RW action, the weight of the super potential is uh, one. And so this W, because it's G invariant, it's just a function on this X zero and we can pull it back to X omega and curly omega, we will all denote it by W. And moreover, later we will actually vary this stability condition, but we will always uh, denote the pullback of this super potential by W. That, that's the basic geometry, so it's uh, simple. Um, and actually we are going to mostly do like e even easier case today. So a GLSM is a billion if the gauge group G is a billion, but we, not only will we assume it's a billion, but to, for most of today, it will just be a torus. Um, so, so then we can just diagonalize the action. So we may assume that like G is embedded in the diagonal torus, which is M, which we assume is M plus kappa dimensional, where kappa uh, is the dimension of the gauge group and N is the dimension of the quotient curly X or X. Um, and then this embedding is just given by uh, M plus kappa characters which we uh, call uh, D1 up to Dm plus kappa. Okay, so 
some notational. So this uh, character lattice, we denote the L check because we want to denote the uh, co-character lattice by L. Um, so, curl so in this case, since it's a billion, then we actually, this curly X omega is smooth Tory doing one first step in the sense defined by Boris of Chen and Smith. And actually, because in, in this case, there's no generic stabilizers. It's just a toric orbital. And yeah, and then this coarse moduli space is a sequential toric variety, which is a uh, semi-projective. Uh, so we can also view it as a, since it's toric, we can view it as a synthetic quotient. And then it will have a synthetic structure. And uh, so, when we view it as a simplicial toric variety, we know the complex structure. And when we view it as a synthetic quotient, if we take the stacky quotient, it's really just a toric Kähler manifold. And now from this point of view, the omega can, uh, can be like L check tensor R. So this, we know the uh, image. So the, um, the maximum compact subgroup, which is compact torus acts uh, Hamiltonianly on this vector space with respect to the standard symplectic structure on the vector space V. And we have this moment map. So the, now the stability condition can be real. So it will just be, um, so LR check can be identified with the view of the compact Kappa dimensional torus. And, and then um, and then the chambers, so there's a secondary fan in this uh, kappa dimensional space. This is a space of stability conditions. And the top dimensional cones are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, the chambers of the stability conditions. So this is uh, a basic geometry. So let, let me just, uh, some simple examples. The first example is the quintic. Um, so in this case, V is uh, C6 with coordinate X1 to X5 and P, G is C star. Since G is C star, the stability condition is uh, just one dimensional real vector space. Um, so gauge charge, so C star acts by weight one, 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 one minus five. And in this case, R charges C star R X just on P. So it's a, the super potential is just P times this, P times this uh, Fermat quintic of uh, in five variables. It's, yeah, apparently it's G invariant and C star X, uh, X by weight, C star R X on W by weight one. Um, so there are two stability conditions. When omega is greater than zero, then we see that the stability condition tells that, that x i one to x five cannot be O zero. The quotient is the total space of the canonical line bundle of P four, which is actually a smooth non-compact toric collabial fivefold. Um, and then the critical locus, yeah. So yeah, you just look at the critical locus and we, we see that um, X, XI cannot be O zero. And so we, um, so the, the critical locus is actually the Fermat quintic uh, embedded in the zero section P4. And in this case, uh, this, the GLSM invariance uh, which are the invariants of the Higgs branch. Uh, so in this case, um, when it's actually the gromov witten invariance of the Fermat quintic. And actually, yeah, so the Konishi structures in symplectic topology were introduced in uh, Fukaya and Ono's paper on Arnold conjecture and gromov witten invariance. Um, there, are, uh, there are many construction of of Witten invariance, but this is one of the constructions. 
using Cronichi structures. Um, so when omega is less than zero, so um, yeah, let's go back. When omega is less than zero, then x1 to x5 can be anything, but p cannot be zero. So we get, uh, so we can use a C star to scale the last corner P to one and we get C5, the or before C5 mod mu five. And the critical point is like supported at the origin, but it's a fat point. So the reduce is just zero. Yeah, it's just C mu five. And in this case, GLSM invariants are uh, one Jarvis one, with an FJRW invariance of this of degree five Fermat polynomial in five variables with the finite group mu five. And these, uh, so the first constructions of this invariance are due to Fun Jarvis one and they in this paper. So these are actually virtual counts of solutions of Witten equation. And yeah, their construction of virtual fundamental cycle was first done via Cronichi structures too. Yeah, so, so um, yeah. So now, uh, so here is the, um, so um, Kyoto and Ron prove a version of Landau Ginsburg Klabial correspondence for quintic threefold. So as we, we see like this Gromov with an invariance of X5 and FJR invariance of W5 and U5, they should be related to like variation of GIT. Um, so they, so it is expected that this invariance actually um, correspond to each other at all genera. This work, uh, Kyoto and Ryan is about genus zero. So let me uh, briefly describe what they did. So first there's a given tall style mirror theorem. Um, yeah, so there's a version in 99, uh, in uh, 90s, uh, in the clavial phase, which says uh, this so-called uh, J function and I function are related by the mirror map where J function, uh, well, this J function is defined in terms of genus zero Gromov with an invariance. And I function um, is uh, explicit um, expression in terms of hypergeometric series. It's called the mirror theorem because actually it, so um, I function and J function are functions of one variable. Here the one variable is a one dimensional Kähler map variable which should be mirrored to the complex variable and it takes value in this four-dimensional complex symplectic space and if uh so so there are four components and there are solutions of uh, the picard equation satisfied by the period integral of the mirror quintic and so if we uh explain so if we look at the complex moduli of the mirror quintic, there's a maximal unipotent uh, boundary monodromy point, which correspond to the clavial phase. And on the orbital point, it corresponds to the landau ginsburg phase. And so, so, the mirror, so the mirror theorem relates um, the J function defined in terms of uh, Gromov Witten invariance in the clavial phase or FJRW invariance in the Landau Ginsberg phase uh, to, um, to the period integral of the mirror quintic. And then the second step is I plus and I minus are related by analytic continuation and the complex linear symplectic isomorphism. So if, if one thinks about the mirror, then it's more natural to see that why they should be analytic continuation of each other. But, but, but actually today, the, the point of the talk is we, we actually don't need to think about the mirror for this kind of wall crossing in a uh, gauge linear sigma model. But before I do so, let's, so this, this was solved, at least in genus zero. 
So the next example for the gauge linear sigma model is the mirror quintic. So now V will become 106 dimensional. The gauge group is 101 dimensional. So the stability condition is like 101 dimensional. There, there will be, yeah, it's the chamber structure will be more complicated. Uh, so yeah, so the details are not, so, so, so there's this gauge group is 101 dimensional. So how to, yeah, so, so to think about this, so this G acts on uh, this 106 dimensional vector space, if we forget about the first five parts, so there's a covering map with, uh, from G to uh, G quotient by G zero, which is, which is the C star, the last, the C, the, the torus correspond to the last 101 coordinates. And the kernel is isomorphic mu five to the fourth power. So uh, one can, it's more convenient to describe uh, the action of this quotient. And so because uh, it's an honest action on G of the gauge group G, but not an honest action of this quotient. So there's this fractional weight. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, the details is not so important, but just to show that there are like it's a lot more complicated. And this is a gauge. Yeah, so the gauge group is uh, 101 dimensional and R charge still acts on the last coordinate. And one can check that with this action and super potential is invariant under the action of the gauge group G. Um, so let's look at uh, the landau ginsberg phase, which will, so, so, Remember, like in the Quinty case, the landau ginsberg case, there's only one P and it course the stability condition is like P is not equal to zero. So now the landau ginsberg phase is like, when we um, choose all the components of the omega to be negative, and then none of the PIs can be zero. So, so yeah, so then we can use the gauge group to, to scale all the PIs to one. And then we are left with this finite group. Now this finite group is um, six, six hundred and twenty-two uh, of order six hundred and twenty-two. Um, so the critical point is, yeah, it's a fatter point at the origin, and B G zero is a bigger group. And in this, in this phase. Uh, the, the GOSM invariants are FJ are invariants of W5, but with this bigger group. Um, so the other, so there's another interesting case is geometric orbifold case, which is given by like blow up. And then we get actually, it's the total space of KP4 quotient by the action of, um, yeah, a finite group, uh, which is isomorphic to mu five to the third power. And then the critical locus is the mirror quintic, which is in, uh, so it's, <coughs> the mirror quintic is in actually this finite quotient of P4. And in this case, in this space, the gauge linear sigma model invariants are or before Gromov with an invariance of this quotient. In earlier days, I think before this orbital gram of Witten events are defined, there's a space where you further resolve. And then, so, so you take some um, resolution of this, uh, this quotient. Um, so, so we have this landau gains per phase, at least for this phase, it's 101 dimensional. So, at least there are like, at least like just next to it, there are 101 chambers. So how about the other 100? So if we just cross one wall, I mean, we will get this and the critical locus will be singular. And there are like many other faces. Okay, so this is, um, um, so in 2003, Fredis and Shoemaker, uh, 
superversion of Landau Ginsburg's Flavial correspondence for the mural quintic. And uh, so mural, so the this the statement should be of the following form orbital groom of Witten invariants um, of the mural quintic should correspond to FJR W invariants of W5 with the finite group G0. Um, so the proof also goes as follows. So first, Lee Shoemaker proved the mirror theorem on the clavial phase. And then Pritis and Shoemaker proved the mirror theorem in the landau ginsburg phase. Yeah, but in this case, because now, the, yeah, even like the smallest, um, smallest phase space is we have 101 Kähler parameters, complexified Kähler parameters. And the state space is 204 dimensional. So this I function and J function are 101 functions of 101 variables, which take values in this 204 dimensional complex simplectic space. And they are related by analytic continuation and complex linear symplectic isomorphism. So yeah, and and so in their original paper, because uh, they use Lee and Shoemaker's mirror theorem, uh, it is like restricted to one variable corresponding to untwisted sectors. Um, so natural question is how to uh, extend this to 101 variables and also wall crossing to the other many other chambers. So these are the motivation uh, examples, and actually we will consider more general abelian gauge linear sigma model. So the Higgs range, uh, so we will, uh, so these are the um, mathematical foundation. Um, so now, so let me, um, Yeah, consider, since we consider, uh, now we are back to a more general GLSM. So G is a more general reductive subgroup of GLV. And let me just give you a rough idea of the GLSM invariants as defined rigorously in these papers. Um, they are virtual counts of uh, landau ginsberg quasi maps. What are they? They are birational maps from genus GL point in orbit curves to this quotient, which extends to um, which extend to a morphism to this quotient stack. So there can be finally many points which are mapped to the unstable locus. So so they are not actually they are quasi maps. And there are some stability conditions, which I will not describe in details. But so we have this picture. Um, okay, so, so we have this map. And then this V quotient by, so this gamma is the subgroup generated by generated by the gauge group and C star R. So F is a morphism from this curve to V quotient by gamma. If we, so there's a map um, from V quotient by gamma to uh, the classifying space of gamma. And, and this is a principal gamma bundle. And the condition is that, so we can further uh, if we project to this, and this is a classifying space of C star. So this morphism corresponds to a line bundle. So the condition tells us that um, this, this line bundle should be the log canonical of the orbit curve. So this is equivalent to the following. So, so the upper half of this diagram is equivalent to the following. So, so this map is equivalent to a principal gamma bundle. And this is, a, um, this F theta is a gamma equivalent map. 
and this is and this gamma equivariant map is also equivalent to a section of the uh, the vector bundle associated to this representation v of gamma so so this is these are the um this landau ginsburg quasi maps and and then uh so now let's specialize to the very special case where g is actually a kappa dimensional torus and this gamma is just kappa dimension comma plus one dimensional torus. So the degree of a map, so if we have a curve, the degree of map should be a class in the second homology of this quotient. In this case, the second homology of this classifying space of this kappa plus one dimensional torus. And because, um, oh, Yeah, because we we some so rationally the um rationally we can us uh, the the co character co of gamma is split into the co character of the gauge group G and the co character of C star W, but the degree of the C star W part is fixed. So this beta is the degree for the <laughs> so this this beta is the rational co-character of the gauge group G. Uh, so here are some notation, but uh, so this so so curly x omega is a toric orbifold. So um so we can write this toric orbifold so if if we have a toric manifold they are they are obtained by gluing a fine toric submanifold in the manifold case each chart is a cn in the orbifold case each chart is cn quotient by gi where gi is a finite group and pi is um uh, is a torus unique torus fixed point, and in orbifold case, it can be stacky, so it's a classifying space of a finite group GI. Um, and then we have uh, effect, so these are the effective curve classes. Okay, so um. In, so let's so let's so there are some work about the um, orbifold quasi map theory, which is about um, gauge linear sigma model without the super potential, and they prove so they prove uh, the they have the following interpretation of the given tau style mirror theorem. So they have a so they have a they define epsilon stable quasi maps to this uh, Tori Zoling Mumford. Oh, actually, this is in more general setting GIT quotient of a vector space by this G. And they introduce the epsilon stability condition uh, when, <coughs> when epsilon goes to plus infinity, one gets a J function defined in terms of gromov witten invariance. Uh, when epsilon goes to zero plus, one gets the I function, which now has this enumerate meaning of quasi counting quasi map genus zero invariance. Uh, they actually def um, prove epsilon wall crossing in terms of virtual cycle, which will imply uh, given tau style mirror theorems, and in particular, mirror theorem for smooth Tori doing my first step proved by Coase, Cordy, Iritani, and Zeng. So, how about um, so Yang Zhou actually proved this quasi map wall crossing in the orbifold gram of orbifold quasi map theory in all genera in full generality. 
And also it is expected he can also do this for the GLSM invariants in full generality, in the generality that uh, it has been defined. And this will imply given how style mirror theorem for all GLSM in all phases. In particular, uh, for the gauge linear sigma model coming from complete intersection in weighted projective spaces. Uh, so this has, so uh, the higher genus epsilon wall crossing uh, has been proved by Clatter agenda along with the appendix by Yang Zhou. So recall that to prove the um, gen, um, Landau-Ginsberg clavial correspondence or more generally wall crossing of GLM, GLSM invariants, um, there should be two steps. So we expect the first step will be completed in this way. So we are going to focus on the second step. Um, so now in orbifold quasi map theory, I function is obtained by torus localization on stacking loop space, which is the orbifold version of given torus toric map spaces. So in the heat range, we are just going to do very similar thing in the um, GLSM version. So we first introduce some notation. Um, yeah, so this is very easy. So for, um, so if um, M is an integer and A is a positive <laughs> integer, uh, P is zero one, let P one O M um, over A be defined by uh, this, um, line bundle on PA1 where, so this is a, a weighted proje projective line. And secondly, if we have a G character, G character defines a line bundle on V quotient by G. And there's a natural lifting of, so recall that T tilde is the big to diagonal torus acting on V. So we choose a T, T tilde equivalent lifting by requiring that T tilde X trivially on C while um, G X by character T on C. So now we will consider this quasi Landau Ginsburg quasi map, but uh, the domain will be just this weighted projective line is very simple and with one mark point, which is the infinity. Um, so there's also a work by Shoemaker towards your theorem for gauge linear sigma models. Um, yeah, so he considered the case uh, G is zero and L is two. So the log canonical is trivial in this case. So th these are just, uh, yeah, possible effective classes. Um, so we introduce, um, so if we fix the effective class, uh, we consider degree beta quasi maps. They are just sections of, they are just given by um, section M plus kappa sections of line bundles on, on, of these line bundles on this uh, weighted P1. So it's, so VB is just the space of deformation of the sections and WB are just a space of obstructions. And in this case, this uh, moduli space is very simple. So this X beta is like the, um, is the quantum version of X and obstruction bung, we have the obstruction bundle. And so now this moduli space is uh, not, usually it's not compact, but uh, so there's a C star action rotates the domain P1. And also, we also want to use the T star, T tilde action. So we, we are going to define some, uh, First, some T tilde equivalent, in, equivalent invariance. But um, so 
but we first define this uh, equivalent invariants, which are torus localization invariants. The superpotential is not invariant under the P theta action. So we are just going to use this um, perfect obstruction theory and the, which is T, T, T theta star, T theta times C star inver, uh, equivalent. And we define and com compute So we consider the following. So in this, in this, um, so in this stacky loop space. So if we evaluate at the infinity, it can, it can go to the unstable point. So we take, uh, we take a open substack such that uh, the evaluation at the infinity actually goes into the stable locus. And since we have an orbifold in general, it will be mapped to a connected component of the inertia stack of the toric orbifold. And the connected component is actually determined by the degree. So now this, uh, so now we use the C star, C star Q action rotating the P1. And this actually, if we restrict the evaluation map, this is actually a closed embedding. So we can push forward. We can do this equivalent push forward and define the T equivalent I function. Um, and now if we take a T equivalent coherent ship and consider the T equivalent K theory class, we define the T equivalent central charge uh, using the T equivalent I function. So here, um, this, um, there's, there is some characteristic classes which takes value in the direct sum of the T, T, T equivalent and C star equivalent cohomology of uh, this connected component of the inertia stack. And because we localize with respect to the C star action, we we actually need to invert the equivalent variable Z of the C star Q and lambda one to lambda M plus kappa are equivalent variable of the uh, big torus T theta. So, so here we get a sum over fixed points. So fixed points are labeled by this uh, minima anti cone I, and we get explicit formula. So, but uh, what we are actually interested in this is this GLSM invariance. So these GLSM invariants are defined using like so the construction of virtual cycle actually uses the super potential. And I will just say the GLSM I function, it will takes value in this relative cohomology. And now the, so for GSLM invariance, we actually, uh, we take a matrix factorization um, instead of, uh, which is defined in terms of the super potential. And we define the GLSM central charge. So these are actually the enumerative invariants uh, in this GLSM theory. So, so now, uh, this matrix, so now this invariance only depends on the K theory class. And this K theory of matrix factorization is a module over. Okay, it is, it's, it's a module over the K theory of the toric orifold itself. And we have a morphism. Basically, matrix factorizing 
So a matrix factorization is a two periodic complex. We just like for, forget about the map of the complex and just remember the vector bundles and we get the K3 class. So this precise, this kind of forgetful map. So because it's a map of modules and so the image is an ideal. Under some, yeah, we can actually do more general than this, but when G is clavial, uh, so under the clavial condition, so the action of G is in SLV, then your quotient will be a clavial toric orbifold. And so assume there's a landau ginsburg phase. For example, we consider Fermat clavial hypersurface in finite quotient of weighted projective spaces. Then this linear map is actually, so, so we tensor by C then, this is actually an injective map. Um, so now we take, so, so suppose that, so here's the fine, suppose that we, we have a, so we are interested in this, um, We are interested in this central charge Z sub W of this matrix factorization or K theory class of a matrix factorization. We first forget, you know, we forget about matrix factorization, just remember the bundle. We get a K theory class and remember we have a canonical lifting to a T, T tilde equivalent class and we compute the uh, T equivalent central charge. And under this assumption, we, we have this explicit computed uh, T equivalent central charge and we it has a non-equivalent limit, which is equal to the GLSM central charge. So, so this is the, so, so the Higgs range is, uh, so we define this uh, T equivalent central charge and which uh, you, the input is a T equivalent K theory class. And in some cases, it can recover the GLSM central charge. The input is a K theory class of matrix factorization. So now, uh, so next, so I would like to describe the Coulomb branch. This is motivated by Hori and Romo. So in Coulomb branch, we have the same data, V, G, C star, W, omega. So here we consider the G is a torus, G is just a torus and is in the diagonal torus and is also um, inside SLV. So club, the quotient will be a club, tori clavia orbifold. So now we consider, so we complex by the stability parameter. We also have an imaginary part, which is usually refer as the B field. So omega is an extended Kähler class because in the or because um yeah in the or in orbital phases it's actually um, include the twisted sectors. Uh, so now let alpha one to alpha m plus kappa be real numbers and delta be a. Uh, so, so in element in the real Lie algebra of the gauge group. And suppose that, so recall that DI are the characters which define the G action on the vector space V. Under this assumptions, uh, so we define the alpha perturb hemisphere or this partition function. The input is a matrix factorization and this is a matrix def factorization defined on the stack without any stability condition. And then it is defined in this way. So it's an integral over like, like the shifted of purely imaginary part. So this, uh, so this, so sigma is the complex coordinate on the complex Lie algebra. Um, sorry.
Yeah, and if you have, so, so basically this uh, CHB is also a function on sigma, but it, it only de depends on K theory class. So if you write your B, like forget about the map, then we just can write this as a, a sum of representation, sum of line bundles on V quotient by G, which are just G characters then this is explicitly given by this. So this integral is very explicit. And this is a Coulomb branch. So what, so this is motivated by Hori and Romo. What we did is we add this uh, like alpha perturb, which is like, like equivariant perturbation um, using the biggest torus. So this is a multi-dimensional inverse Malin transform of this. And moreover, when we specialize, when we let alpha i goes to zero, we get a, uh, we get a without super potential case. And when alpha i goes to qi over two, recall that qi are uh, r charges, uh, we get a um, invariant with, with super potential. Okay, so here is a proposition. So there's an open subset U in the dual of the real Lie algebra. Yeah, this is an open subset in the space of uh, stability conditions, such that this, this partition function, uh, so now we just apply it to a, T, a G character is an analytic function in this complexified Taylor parameters. So omega can be anything, but B plus T, the, yeah, B plus T must be in this open subset. So suppose that, so here's the first theorem is, uh, suppose that C is the phase of GLSM. So, or a chamber in the st space of stability condition. So it's the interior of a kappa dimensional cone in the secondary fan in the view of the real, really algebra. Then there's an open subset um, you see such that, um, so this UI are the, so this C is an intersection of certain cones where, where this, so, and uh, so this UI are shifted cones and UC is the intersection such that uh, if omega is in UC uh, determined by this chamber, then there's this uh, expansion. Oh, uh, what time? Okay, nine minutes. Nine minutes? Okay, so um, so so then in chamber we have this expansion. Uh, this is sum over minima anti cone, anti cones, and there's this uh, explicit expression. Um, and moreover, this infinite series z i converges, so converges in uh, u i. And we have the following his Coulomb correspondence. Basically, if we do the, this change of variable, then so the right-hand side was uh, defined in the Higgs branch is defined by like virtual count using the uh, big torus action. And the left-hand side is just by um, expanding this integral. Okay, so the, so the proof is by careful multiplication of kappa dimensional cycles. So recall that at the beginning we have this shifted, uh, so pure, purely shifted purely imaginary cycle, which is R kappa, and in each step, like we get, um, yeah. So so the first step we get a finite sum over a one-dimensional lattice. 
or actually uh, the positive part of one dimensional lattice. And each term is an integral over circle times alpha kappa minus one. And so one continues to deform this contour until in the last step, we get a finite sum and also where the finite sum over anti-cones, which are in one minima anti-cones, which are one-to-one -one correspondence with the torus fixed point uh, in, of the toric uh, orifold in this phase. And then there's a sum over, uh, yeah, kappa sum over um, kappa non-negative integers. So now in the last step, each integral is an integral over a kappa dimensional torus. This is a kappa dimensional residue and just evaluate it. And it's exactly the same as the answer given, uh, obtained in the Higgs branch. And this actually clavial condition is, uh, is important. And the expansion in, in a particular phase only depends on the case theory class in that phase. So finally, uh, so wall crossing. So how can we, uh, apply this to wall crossing. So recall that uh, in the Higgs, Higgs phase, so the this central charge are obtained by pairing um, uh, by pairing with uh, the I function. So basically, you can obtain the I function by looking at all the possible central charges. So now the question is like, so now it remains to do the analytic continuation of the central charges. And we are going to use this Higgs Coulomb correspondence because this tells us that compute the formal power series defined by the Higgs branch actually can be written as this um, contour integral. So in when, uh, for abelian gauge lima linear C model without superpotentials, there were previous work by Borisov and Hoja for clavial and non equivalent. And for, for Coates and Iritani and Jung, uh, they did the case were uh, equivalent and not necessarily clavial, but it's still a Krepin transformation. So suppose that we have two adjacent chambers in the uh, space of stability conditions. So their intersection is a kappa minus one dimensional cone and it's contained in some hyperplane. So recall that C plus and C minus are like in the dual of the Lie algebras. So this edge is a, um, a lattice point in the Lie algebra or it's a co it's a co-character. So suppose that um, suppose that omega plus and minus are in the in these two chambers next to each other, and correspondingly we get x plus and by minus. They are birational to each other, and they are both clavial orbitals. And then recall that so so basically this is some common toric. So basically. The recall that in each phase, the minim, the minima anti cones are in one to one correspondence with the torus fixed point. So the so um so one can so for each phase it can be split into essential anti cones and non essential anti cones. Non-essential anti-cones correspond to the torus fixed point outside the exceptional locus. So they are in both phases. And the essential uh, anti-cones correspond to the fixed point, which is in, in the exceptional locus. So in the setting above, so assume that, so recall that T is a G character. 
And suppose that, and B is a B field, suppose that B plus T and H is this, uh, so H is this co-character or one parameter subgroup of the gauge group, which defines the wall. Suppose that the absolute pair value of this pairing is less than this. So you see this defines certain window. And then there exists an open subset such that uh, the, this partition function of this LT has this expression. So basically, um, if you have, so ZI is the contribution from the fixed point, which, which are on both sides of the wall. So they actually, um, they actually converge. So for this fixed I, if it's in a non-essential cone, it actually uh, converges absolutely and uniformly in UI, which contains both UC plus and UC minus. And then this essential cone can be written as some explicit series of integrals <coughs> over circle times kappa minus one times R. So this actually shows that if T satisfy this is in this window determined by B, then these two this partition functions are actually related by analytic continuation. So, um, oh, I think I'm over time. So I just last thing I just want to mention that uh, the uh, so the so this is the gray restriction rule, and it defines the equivalence of a derived category of coherent sheep of T equivalent and non-equivalent. And it also induces equivalence of this category of matrix factorizations. And theorem two actually implies that this symplectic transformation is basically given by this this equivalence. So if we take some brain in, which is an element in the matrix factorization in the plus chamber, and we apply this, uh, this equivalence, then these two are related by analytic continuation. Okay, so, so in the non-equivalent case, this gray, this gray restriction rule is actually coincide with green Mukai transformation, which was proved by Kawamata to be equivalent. In the uh, equivalent case, uh, Kozi, Ritani, John, and Siegel proved that gray restriction rule agree with the free Mukai transform. And for the version with uh, matrix factorization, um, so there are like several work. Um, Okay, I'm sorry for running over time. Thank you for your attention.